um, John Medved and Ola himself, the CEO and founder of Our Crowd. John is a serial entrepreneur and is without a doubt one of the, font, the founding fathers of the venture capital industry here in Israel. Uh, if John is funding and supporting startup companies by day, he is a defender of Israel by night. He is a fierce advocate for Israel. Um, without further ado, John, I'd love to welcome you to the stage. When the Katzins ask you to show up, uh, it's an offer you can't refuse. They do so much good and so much important work. And when they spoke particularly about this night's event and said, look, it's going to be a little bit business, a little bit, I don't like the word Hasbara, but let's say info war and about how people can help in social media and it's going to be a lot Russian, I said, I'm in. Okay, that's, that's what, you know, what can be possibly wrong with that evening? So that's why I'm here. And I'm going to do something a little bit different with my remarks, and I uh, beg your indulgence. I want to get as personal as I can, and I want to let you know a little bit about my family's story, my own story, how it makes sense in the context of Israel over the last several decades and talk about my kids. And if we can do that in a short period of time, then I'll have succeeded. My grandparents, my Baba and my Zaidi, uh, lived in a little town called Machnevka. Does anybody know where Machnevka is? Yeah, sure. Who's, who's that sure? Are we, are we, are we related? Uh, <laughs> But Machnevka is very close to Vinitsa. Uh, not Machnevka, okay. Down the road from Chmelnik, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, wonderful. So they had a typical Jewish life in the shtetl, which was pogrom, pogrom, pogrom. I grew up hearing stories about my Bubba surviving uh, attacks by Cossacks. In 1910, Maizeda got on a boat, went to America, and his idea was that he was going to save enough money to bring my Bubba and the five children who were with them to America. In 1914, my Bubba sets out on this journey because he had saved enough money working very hard. He was a barrel maker who made barrels and did a little bootlegging on the side and that probably was more profitable than the barrel so I guess he's the first generation entrepreneur in the Medved family. And my Bubba sets out on this journey. She gets to the border with Austria and it's Erev Tishabov. They were religious people. And she said, I'm not crossing the border on Erev Tisha B'Av. It's a fast day. We need to stay put. We'll start the journey the day after Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av 1914 was the start of World War I. We learn in, in, uh, from you know, rabbis that we look at the Holocaust as one entity with World War I and World War II, and it really started that Tisha B'Av on 1914. So, when Tishba was over, she couldn't cross. And she had to take the five kids all the way back to Machnevka. And 10 years later, 10 years later, 1924, four of the five children were dead from uh, hunger, typhus, and whatnot. And she set out with her one remaining son and got to America, was reunited after 14 years with my Zeta, and she was uh, 50 years old at the time. Within three months of this reunion, she was deadly sick, really sick. And in particular, her stomach was not well. She saved had enough money to go see a doctor. And the doctor says, lady, Mrs. Medved, you have cancer and you're going to die very soon. 
because it's, it's, it's growing really fast. And they were shocked, crying. Finally, one of their friends had some money and said, look, that doctor you went to go see, he's a shicker, okay? Don't trust him, he's a drunk, okay? You should go get a second opinion. Now, poor people in the 20s in America didn't get second opinions, she got a second opinion. And the doctor said, that guy is really drunk. Lady, you have no cancer, you have a baby. <laughs> and the baby was my father. <laughs> Dr. David Ned, who was born to these very simple pshutei yidin, okay? Lovely people, came from the Ukraine, and my father worked really hard in South Philly, went to a really good high school, ended up getting a scholarship to Penn, became a PhD in physics, met my mother, who had come from a refugee family from Germany, and then did what anyone smart in 1950s did in America, which is go to California. And I was born in San Diego, that lovely place. My dad was a surfer, and he would, a rocket scientist, worked for a defense company, and he would work with rockets in the day, and he would surf at night, and life was wonderful. I grew up mostly in Los Angeles, and for me, life was simple. I knew stories about my grandparents, but we were not religious. I loved cheeseburgers and tacos from the trucks in East Los Angeles. And I was an active political kid, okay? I, I was growing up in a very exciting time. I walked precincts for Bobby Kennedy in 68. I worked for George McGovern in 72. I ran my campus's anti-war movement in 1970 against the war in Vietnam. And that was my life and my direction. And finally, after graduating in 1972, high school, you know, really the height of the 60s, 60s didn't end till 75, um, I went to Berkeley, because where are you going to go? It was cheap, it's California, great school, and that was a wonderful first year of college. Except after that first year, I wanted very much to go abroad, because everybody I knew, they were going to Marrakesh, they were going to Barcelona, they were going to Japan, and I was jealous. And I asked my parents, I said, hey, will you send me, I spoke Spanish, because I had done some work in the barrio with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, and I could speak Spanish, I said, will you send me like to Mexico, that's cheap. My parents looked at me like I was a crazy person and said, if you want us to really pay for you to go somewhere this summer and you're not gonna get a job and make some money, there's only one place we're gonna pay for you. I said, where's that? He said, Israel. Israel! Yeah, you got cousins, you need some Jewish seasoning. So I came here. It was 1973 in July. I was here July, August, and September. I loved the place. In those six years between 67 and 73, it was golden. And finally, at the end of the trip, some of my madrichim said, will you come hang out with us? We're in Miluim, and we're actually stationed on the Suez Canal, and it's really cool down there, because we drink vodka, and we play volleyball. This is literally what they said, uh, you know, I'm not going to quote any names, and I said, whoa, that sounds cool. I'll ask my parents. I'm some kind of doofus, okay? I can't believe that I would actually pick up the phone, which cost a lot of money in those days, and call my parents and say, will you let me stay in Israel for another couple of weeks, and I'll just push school off and go to the Suez Canal? And they said, get your butt home now or you're fried. Okay, so come home. I get to Berkeley. School starts. Three days later, the 1973 Yom Kippur War happened. And if you want to know about the Yom Kippur War, 
you can do a couple of things. Watch the movie Golda, which is quite amazing, I think. Or just think about what we're going through now, except compress it into a couple of weeks. The country and the world were shocked. And on my campus in 1973, the Arabs went wild with delight. There were Iranian, uh, speaking to the, uh, I think Elon was here, uh, the Iranian Students Union started organizing rallies, death to the Jews in 73, the Arab students. And the Jewish students were all scared. No one wanted to do anything, okay, because even though many were political activists, what are, you, what are we going to do for Israel? We're going to do something? And I got angry because I had spent my whole childhood doing political things. And I said, we're going to get out there. We're going to do stuff. And so we built something called the Israel Action Committee, which today, I guess it's 50 years later, still exists at the University of California, Berkeley. It's the leading activist organization. And we started inviting Jewish students, and we were doing all the things that advocacy and whatnot were doing 50 years ago. And it was scary because we were outnumbered, and not everybody understood us, certainly at Berkeley. But it was the most exciting, wonderful time of my life. One little vignette, which will tell you a little bit about what life was like in those days. It was in, I think, 1970. Five, when Arafat came to the UN, I don't know if any of you remember this and know this episode where he was invited and he came with his gun stuck in his, I can't say fat belly because I've got one, but you know, in his belly. And basically, the students on campus surprised us and had organized a huge rally in support of Arafat that day. And I got a call about 9.30 in the morning when I was sleeping some kind of hangover through, okay, and missing classes. And this is Berkeley after all, guys, come on. Okay, and uh, I remember the guy said, Medved, where are you? How came we're not on the campus? We gotta organize, there's gonna be a huge rally. What are we gonna do? And I said, what, what? And I was like, and he explained to me what's going on. And I had like, it was gonna be at noon. So I had two hours to do something. What do you do if there are gonna be thousands of wild students chanting in favor of Arafat at Berkeley, and he got two hours to respond, and there is no internet. There is no mobile phone. There is no AI. There's none of these tools. There's, you know, at best a, uh, a print shop, okay, where you can print, but there's no time. You can't do anything, so what do you do? Well, you know what I did? I went back to bed. No, I did. I went to my bed, and I pulled off a sheet. And I took the sheet, and I cut a hole in it, put the sheet on my head. Uh, I think it was near Purim time, and I had some white face. And I took white face and put it all over my face. And then I went to my refrigerator, and I had one of those like quart giant bottles of Heinz ketchup, and I poured it all over myself, and then I hand painted a sign that said Ma'alot, which was the most horrible attack where the PLO had butchered Israeli children up in the north of the country. And I walked to campus. Now, Number one, there was a trail of bees because of the ketchup and the, and the sweet stuff following me. So, and most people, like Berkeley, the nickname was Berserkly, okay? And you see strange things in Berkeley, but this was pretty strange. People gave me a wide berth. No one really bothered me as I walked to campus. And I just sort of walked up, got to the middle of the big plaza where you knew the protest was gonna be, and they were busy getting set up and they had the podium. And I stood. I put my arms like this. I had the sign saying, Malo, 
I had my ketchup and my white face, and I stood. And it took the organizers of their rally a few minutes to figure out what was going on, and then they started hassling me. Like, get out of here, buddy, we're gonna, you know. And I just stood. And some friends of mine were already in the growing crowd, and they saw I was being hassled, and they called the, the campus police. And they were smart enough to tell the police, you gotta protect that guy. This is the home of free speech. Remember, Berkeley was where there was the free speech movement. And so the police said, he can stand there. So through that entire rally, they were speaking, spewing their anti-Israel, crappy Arafat stuff. And I stood there with a silent message of what this is all about. The next day, this rally was in all the press, the campus press, the San Francisco press. It made some national press. The pictures all showed the speaker and me. The TV came. And then I agreed to speak afterwards, OK, because I was going to give an interview. But the point of this is very much where I, I appreciated this prior panel. One person in an hour or two getting out of the shower, as it were, Elon, OK, can have an impact. You just have to have a little creativity, some ketchup, and some guts, OK? And, and you can do it. And that's pretty much what I did for the next six years of my life. The Jewish agency, God bless them, gave me my first real job to go organize students on campuses. My job was to train kids to handle propaganda and to fight the info war back in the 1970s. And I was given a car and I drove around the West Coast. And 77 to 79, I actually ran this on a national basis. And then I came to Israel. I made Aliyah because I sort of imbibed so much Zionism. And it was so compelling to me that I just, you know, what, after selling this stuff for six years, you got you to gotta buy it, OK, yourself. And I came. Now, when I got here in 1980, it was very different. It was a couple years before the Lebanon War. And I remember my father showed up about a year after I made Aliyah to see how he was doing. And my father had become an entrepreneur. My father, from his surfing and rocket days, had moved on to fiber optics. And he had been part of a team that sold their company to Xerox. And he was doing a new company. So he asked me if I would take him uh, on a trip up to Raphael, which is the, uh, you know, today the makers of Iron Dome, et cetera. And he said, look, you can hang out at this meeting, help me with translation, but you know, we'll spend the day together. So I went with, his, with him to the meeting. And these guys were talking about fiber optics. Now, I studied history in school, OK? I never stepped foot in a computer science class, in a physics class, in an engineering class. I knew nothing about technology. And they're sitting talking fiber back and forth, and I'm bored silly. There is no iPhone. Where is my iPhone? OK, it's 1982, you know, four years before the iPhone. And at the end of this interminable meeting, one of these guys turns to me and says, OK, Medved Jr., what are you doing in Israel with your life? And I have this big smile. I said, well, you know, I'm doing a little unofficial tour guiding. I'm teaching a class in Zionism at the Hebrew University at night. I'm doing a little this and a little of that. And the guy looked at me and said, Halturot. OK, you know? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, Halturot. And he goes, you're an Askan. You're like a bureaucrat. Guys like you, we have a dime a dozen. We have thousands of them. Your dad, he's an entrepreneur. Do you know what that is? And I said, no, not, not really. He goes, he's building companies. He's doing fiber optics. That's what Israel needs. And so on the way home from, this was uh, the north of Haifa, I said, Dad, will you explain to me what you do? 
And he started and said, son, it's going to take a while. It's going to start with Ohm's Law. And my father father was a professor also. In any event, I joined my father's company. He gave me $100 a month to stay in Israel. And that, by the way, covered most of my rent in those days. And that's how I started. And I loved it. And I taught myself. And I reinvented myself. Because in Israel, we have this, in the Zionist movement, we have this phrase, you know, Anu Banu Alza Bivnot Uli Banota. Okay? We've come to Israel to build and to be built by it. And the idea is really one of constant reinvention. Today, we know how important that is. We know that you're trained in something and three and five years later it doesn't matter you've got to learn something else everybody's afraid of what AI is going to do to their job and their career but this country has been since its beginning at its core a country of reinvention where people came from all over the world and reinvented themselves if they were smart they kept their roots they kept their memories their values their religion. I got to religion later. That's a whole nother story, but we won't go there at the moment. Make a long story short, I built a company with my dad and we sold it to a big oil company with my first exit. I raised money for him here in the country and there was no venture capital. The first venture capital was set up here in 1986 and I raised my money for my dad in 1985. So I've been here since the beginning of this startup nation story. I've been a player or a actor, not just a witness, but a person trying to be a subject in this drama. And we have a lot to be proud of. I went on to build many companies of my own. I went on to build one of Israel's first venture capital funds called the Israel Seed Partners, together with Michael Eisenberg, Neil Cohen, and Alan Feld. I made, so far to date, I've made over 500 investments in different companies, so I've invested in a lot of of technologies. And lately, about 10 years ago, I started something called Our Crowd, which we're very proud to be sponsoring and helping here. And today, our crowd is the most active venture investor in the country. We have uh, about 450 direct investments. We have 56 funds. We're managing $2.5 billion. And we, together in our funds, we employ over 10,000 people in this country. We have what's called the diversified portfolio. The idea behind our crowd was that individual investors could actually join the professionals and make money. Okay, so for example, how many of you know who NVIDIA is today? Okay, everybody more or less knows NVIDIA. How many of you wish that you had had a chance to invest in NVIDIA anytime? <laughs> okay, including a week ago. <laughs> Okay, the point is that we all know that great money and fortunes are made by investing in technology companies. But the people who make the most money are those who get in when they're still private. You know, every now and then you'll get an NVIDIA that goes up three or four hundred percent in a year. That's a wonderful and beautiful thing. But very often you can find companies where you invest ten thousand dollars and you can turn it into a hundred thousand dollars. I've not only done it many times myself, but I've had enabled many people to do it. You also lose money, by the way. It's, it's called in this, in our language, it's called hon sikun, which means danger capital. In English, the word venture capital sounds like a trip to Disneyland. Okay, in Israel, it's sort of dugre, you know, it's danger, okay, flashing, which you should keep in mind. But if done correctly, it can be great. So we've set this up. We've got this tremendous portfolio. We've had 63 exits, companies that have gone out, big companies like Lemonade or like Uber, where we sold them 
a small company and have their shares, etc., etc. We invest with very big names in terms of other venture capital funds, and we're backed by a bunch of really serious institutional investors. We focus on a variety of sectors, so you know whether it's clean energy or AI, cybersecurity. We want to give people the ability to have a diversified portfolio. We are stage diversified, so we do early stage into late stage. We're all over the world today. We're actually making investments not just in Israel, but around the world, and that's important because we want to connect all the entrepreneurs in the world to Israel. And they come here for our annual summit, where we had 9,000 ticket holders last year. It's not going to happen this year for obvious reasons, but the Shana Haba, the Yerushalayim at the Our Crowd Summit, and I invite you all to come. In fact, if you, when we do put the tickets out, if you just put on a message, okay, that you were at the Aliyah Tech Conference, I'll get you a ticket. Okay, you have that, oh, that word. Okay. Don't tell anybody, Ali, that I said that. Um, we are very committed to AI and artificial intelligence of all. We've made 81 investments in AI, and we believe that it's going to change everything. In particular, we have an unbelievable company called Halo, which is doing AI chips that actually accelerate the AI. Sort of sounds like NVIDIA, but what they're doing is doing it for the edge, which is really cool. And I want to make one point, though, which is important, which is in a crisis, great companies are built. And therefore, I am sure that coming out of Israel now, with the Meluim Nakim who are coming back, who, believe it or not, have had a little time between battles to think. There are going to be great companies invented here, which we are all going to get a chance to invest in. And God willing, some of them will be like these. These are companies that were built in the middle of crisis. Crisis creates great companies. Now, there's a crisis in terms of money around the world, in terms of going to venture capital. It's down about 60% worldwide, Israel a little more, but they look the same, these curves. And yet, during the war, the world is supporting Israel. Very often we get this attitude that the world hates us, that everybody's against us. We see it on the press, we see it on social media. I just want to use a bad word. Bullshit. It's not true. It's really not true. When you look at the world, the world is much more complex. There are billions of Christians, and today many, many Christians, far from disliking Israel, love Israel. Sometimes a lot, <laughs> okay, maybe a little. Uh, but Christians certainly are talkable. Asians, East Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, they don't hate Israel. The reality is that, that we have tremendous potential in relationships with our friends in Asia. Okay, and the, the man on the street is very, very positive. I think even in Russia, where there's tremendous anti-Semitism, or in Poland or other countries where they haven't got rid of it yet, I've seen polling data that shows that the average man on the street, not that it matters, not that Mr. Putin is listening to these people, okay? But the reality is that there are people who like us. And it's not black and white. It's not all over. It's not all finished. We have what to work with. And if you look at the tech community, these companies have all been supporting us, okay? This is the most amazing thing, is in the middle of the war, Intel invests $25 billion more in Israel. Intel has so much going on here, they should change their logo to say Israel inside. Okay, because they are basically, without Israel, there would be no Intel like we know it today. And, you know, we are having companies that are growing 
and doing wonderful things even during the war. And so don't think that it's all dark, okay? These are just some of the headlines that are being made by, by our companies. Now, some people say, well, but wait, the stock market must have crashed. It didn't happen. The stock market went down and the stock market came right back up. Okay, I wish I had listened to my own advice and I should have bought the Israeli exchange. Okay, the Shekel did the same thing, by the way. And people like Jeffries, the investment bank, are publishing reports about how important Israel's resilience is. So to bring this home and to try to, and we're doing a lot of work at our crowd. We did one project which I want to talk about, which you might be able to take advantage of. As soon as the war broke, we said we have to set up a fund, a special fund that will help country, companies weather the storm. Because companies were having a more difficult time to raise money. It's not easy to raise money in general, especially not now worldwide. But in Israel at war, it gets extra special difficult. And so we created the Israel Resilience Fund. And we have actually, since the war started, announced it, raised the money. And we have now made 26 investments in different companies to support them during the war. And I'm very, very proud of that. And this is our last piece of good news, but not the last for tonight. For tonight. Uh, we just announced a victory in Korea in the middle of the war. The Korean government announced that they're going to do a fund with Israel, together with our crowd, which is an $80 million fund. It's now been upscaled to $95 million, and it's going to be very exciting. So those slides, you can take them off now for a second. How are we going to end this? What's going to be with the next generation? How are they performing? What about our kids? What about the future? Because people like me, unfortunately, I've, I think I've gone pretty much over the halfway point in my life. And I'm not trying to be morbid or ridiculous, but I'm just playing the odds here, guys. Okay, you can figure out how old I am by knowing that I went to school in 1972, okay? So, we've had our run. I'm not going anywhere yet. I've got lots of work to do. But this whole story is really in your hands. Most of the people in this audience are young people. And I'll tell you, watching what you guys have done in this war is amazing. I think that deserves applause. This generation. <laughs> you guys rock. And you see it everywhere. You see it in the Miluim. You see it in the companies. I'm watching these companies led by 30-year-olds, where 20% of the workers are out in Miluim and they're keeping the companies going and delivering and raising money. You see it in the charitable acts of Chesed, which this entire society has come together. I guess Hamas doesn't know Chazal or know how to get the Jews going. Because we're approaching Purim. It was just Purim Ketan, Purim Gadol is on its way. And we know that we call Haman Sorer Hayudim. Haman would attack and close in on the Jews. Except what we also know is when you do that, you create Jewish unity. You create the Tzor, like Tzor HaChayim, where the Jews get together. And when the Jews get together, Kanosa Di Yehudim, there is no stopping us. And this unity which we've achieved, we cannot let go. Okay, that is the most important. Anybody, I, know, I, I, I love that campaign I saw just a couple weeks ago, I don't know what happened to it, where it said, if you're talking nonsense about divisive issues, 
and bringing us back to a pre-October 7th reality, stomach the pain, okay? Just keep your mouth shut because this unity is incredibly important for us going forward. I see it in my children. I'm very proud of my children and my grandchildren because reality is that no matter what you've done in your life, whether you've been a businessman or an artist or an author or a school teacher or a psychologist or a bus driver or a farmer, all of that does good in the world. Except the most important thing you can do is to build a family. And I'm not making comments about what kind of family, okay? But build a family, have Jewish children, and pass it on. Okay, that's the most important thing you can do. And they say that the blessing, you get a chance to see your children's children, is the greatest blessing. Because that, that, because that takes you to immortality, right? There is no immortality. Nobody's immortal. We're all going to die. But the fact that you see that your life values, that what's important, that the love for Israel is strong and vibrant in this generation, that's all that matters. That's what makes me happy. It gets me up every day to fight again and again and again because the kids are doing incredible work. So with that, I want to do a little bit of shepping naches, as my Baba and Zeta would have said, and take you back where I have the ability of showing you some work that my kids are doing. And I want you to play the first video, but wait, just wait, let me introduce it. My son Yossi, Yossi, you still here? He might not be, but it's okay. If he's not, he's back home with his wife Dasha and his son. And Yossi is a filmmaker who was uh, five years in Honda Sakravit as an officer, combat engineering, he served Milouim for years. Yeah, let's hear it for that guy. Uh, he had an, uh, uh, a back injury, so he was deferred, but he volunteered for Milouim. And in the middle, the, the guys from Sahal here are going to love this, in the middle of the war, his unit said, get out of here and make propaganda movies. Okay? And he did. So I'm going to show you a 30-second movie he made. And this movie has so far gotten over 25 million views. One person can do this. Take a look. he spent the grand total of two thousand dollars of his own money to make and then put it up and the next thing it just went viral on its own 25 million views I'm going to show you some other work I've got four beautiful children 14 grandchildren but I'm going to just show you end with my daughter uh, Nina Medved who's married to a Yoni Tokayer Yoni spent hundred and thirty days in Miluim, in combat, leading his pluga, but they're singers, and they did this song. If you could play this song, I think this is the most appropriate song to end. And with that, I'm just going to walk off the stage and say again, thank you. Let's play, play the song. לבית כנסת כשעלית על מדים 
בפינת הרחוב נפרדת ממני ומהילדים הסברתי שאבא עכשיו צריך לשמור ולא רציתי שידעו ממה ובדרך אנשים שאלו מה אתם עושים בחוץ פרצה מלחמה אז עכשיו אני אוספת את כל הכוחות של חסד ושל אמונה שעוד יבואו ימים של טוב שעוד תשוב אלינו הרינה ומחבק את חזק את הילדים רק להגן מהסופות שבחוץ ובתוך הטירוף מול שמיים שחורים מלקטת כוכבים בלילות הראשונים לא ישנתי, טרוך על המשמר. חתמתי על ציוד בעולם מקביל, נפרדתי מכל מה שמוכר. יש כאן אחוות לוחמים בימים מתישים, מבלי לדעת מה יהיה מחר. שבועות כבר הפכו חודשים, ובכל זאת נשארים עד שהאופק יואר. אז עכשיו אני שולח לך ים של כוחות, של חסד ושל אמונה, שעוד יבואו ימים של טעום, שעוד תשוב אלינו הרינה. אז תחבקי חזן את הילדים, רק להגן מהסופות שבחוץ, ובתוך הטירוף מול שמיים שחורים. ולקט לך כל הבוץ הגדוע אליך, ולמרות שקשה כאן לבד, לפעמים כדי לנצח ביחד, צריך לעמוד בנפרד. כל אחד בחזית שלו עד הניצחון. אז לעכשיו אני אוספת את כל הכוחות. של חסד ושל אמונה, שעוד יבואו ימים של טוב, שעוד תשוב אלינו הרינה, ומחבקת חזק את הילדים, רק להגן מהסופות שבחוץ, ובתוך הטירוף מול שמיים שחורים, מלקטת כוכבים. This is the generation.